Hello and welcome to Bloke on the Range. Now I've got the opportunity here in my friend's rather echoey winter garden to present to you today a very early British 7.62mm target rifle from the very very late 60s or early 70s. Now a bit of background to this was that the serious competition programme for full bore rifles back in the day it was shot in two categories with the service rifle. Now, um, you had service rifle A, which was unmodified as issued, like this uh, particularly nice Fazakali 1955, one of the last ones, um, and also in service rifle B, which is basically the same rifle with a set of target sights on it, and you were allowed to do various things internally to fettle the bedding. Now, uh, let's just take the... Uh, the interwar period, people would typically shoot a fettled SMLE or a P14. After World War II, there were tons and tons of number fours that came on the market, and uh, they were shot with them. Uh, the general trend, the general belief was that the P14 shot better at short range, which was 200, 500, and 600 yards, and that the SMLEs or number fours shot better at long range, which was 900 and 1,000 yards, uh, due to something called positive compensation, which we'll get onto at another time, because it's kind of a complex topic and whether it really exists or not, mm, there's some rifles I know of that definitely exhibit it, but as a general thing, general truth, mm. anyway, another time. We will also have the opportunity to show a service rifle B at some point. Now, typically uh, with an SMLE, it will be packed up at the front, with a number four, they were typically centre bed it. Now, if you remember earlier videos, a number four in military bedding has a two to six pounds of up pressure at a bearing there at the muzzle. And what they'd do is they would make a bearing around the front band where there's a, there's a reinforced bit of the stock in there. Uh, and they'd free it up at the muzzle so it would be a free float from there forward. Now, uh, barrels this light don't shoot well fully free floated which is why they didn't make them like that, and the target shooters didn't set them up like that. They typically were center bedded. Uh, there were various post-war tests, because uh, the Indian arsenals, when they refurbed number fours, would set them up like that. Uh, some of the wartime number fours were free-floated because with uh, rapidly dried timber during the war, it was easier to set them up as a free float. They wouldn't shoot as well, but they, it was good enough for government work as a conscript bang stick. Uh, the test basically said that for service use, the, uh, the front bedding was the best, and for the number four T sniper rifles, uh, they only ever approved the conventional bedding with the muzzle pressure at the front, although any that went through an Indian refurb may have a center bedding. Now, anyway, so uh, this continued until 1968-1969 shooting seasons, when there was a transition over to heavy barrel 7.62 millimeter target rifles. Um, now, this decision was taken basically because uh, the SLR was deemed to be not accurate enough for serious target work, and it sort of broke the link between the service rifle and serious target shooting. Uh, the Swiss, on the other hand, because, because their serious target shooting is uh, more intimately tied into the, the Swiss militia army, they kept the link and a lot of serious target shooting is done with uh, Stumgewehr 57s and Stumgewehr 90s. Anyway, the link was broken. Lots of people had a target fettled number four of that era, and a lot of them got converted into target rifles. And this is a nice example of one of them. Now, the Enfield factory itself did actually make an official army target rifle for service participation in uh, in target rifle competitions it was the called the l39 and it's basically uh like an l42 sniper rifle but with target sights uh, this one which was made by we don't know who it is not marked uh, has been scrubbed of its original markings aside from its serial number and uh, some proof marks was fitted with a 1969 dated enfield hammer forged barrel a butt probably off of a number eight or an Envoy Enfield commercial target rifle and with a cut down fore end. 
And this one's quite interesting. I mean, there's my first rifle that I ever owned, uh, it was one of these L39 alikes, but it was a very minimalist conversion. I mean, all that had happened to mine was that it had an Enfield barrel, 7.62 barrel fitted. It had been cut off about here and had a sling swivel mounted straight into the wood at the front there and a target sling swivel on the bedding screw there like this one. This one's had a little bit more done to it and in fact the forend has been shortened and the band refitted about an inch and a half further back. Now other interesting things about this, this is, as I said, this is one of the minimalist conversions. So the extractor on this is still the 303 extractor, uh, which means it will extract fine, but it won't eject. Because if you remember earlier videos, the ejection on the number four involves the, uh, the spring-loaded claw pushing the, uh, the rim of the cartridge against the left side wall of the receiver and friction kicks it out. Uh, with the short ejector, sorry, with the short extractor, these uh, these won't eject typically. And in fact, with the 7.62 magazine, uh, they eject off of the magazine lip, not off of the side wall of the receiver. Um, a little tangent: there are two types of 7.62 magazines, neither of which we have here. One of which, I believe, this is the ones made by Sterling, don't need the receiver to be bona fide, but the ones made by Enfield do. Um, they need to be relieved slightly internally so they're not necessarily a drop-in part if you happen to have a 7.62 uh, number four which doesn't have the right magazine they left the 303 magazines in them because uh, you weren't allowed to load out the magazine under the competition rules so they were just used as a loading platform just for for loading single rounds otherwise the barrel is uh, relatively heavy it's longer than the service barrel and the trigger's been fettled, as you'd uh, expect. This one has actually quite a nice, quite a nice light trigger pull on it. Um, it's been fairly well done. Now the sights are a Parker Hill 5C, which I've also shown in an earlier video, shown mine one. And this one is exactly how my friend received it. And uh, it's set at about 900 yards because the general belief that the rear locking number four action shot better at long range carried over into the 7.62 era because of this belief in positive compensation even though once you've once you've fitted a heavy rigid barrel to it there's no reason for it effectively and as i said this is a complicated topic and we'll go into it in detail another time but when you're shooting at a high level of competition, an awful lot of it, probably 90% of it is psychology. And if you believe your rifle is sh shoots better at long range than short range, you will shoot better with it at long range than at short range. And by better, I'm talking about sort of the angular dispersion. I'm not saying that, that you'll shoot actual groups that are smaller, but in, in, uh, in relation to the target size, in relation to the number of minutes of angle of your, of your group, there's a general belief that you shot better. Um, Let's just say that uh, I've shot a fair number of these. Lots of people shot these at various distances. And I'm sure people will say I had one that did, but they're all individuals. So very early on in the 7.62 era, people wanted to do better. And uh, there was the Swing 71 action, which was a quad locking, like four massive lugs, massive bolt, uh, awful primary extraction, uh, rigid, solid lump of metal action uh, that came in from 1971 onwards, and they just that, those sorts of actions, uh, Musgraves, uh, which are a Mauser 98 type but massively uprated and in a solid, rigid, fully enclosed action, uh, they started to dominate. And the old converted number fours, converted uh, uh, Mauser 98s, converted P P 14s started to fall by the wayside for the serious shooters. Um, and what, one of the advantages of, of these was that it was relatively cheap because, I mean, these things were practically worthless at the time and a gunsmith could buy a more or less drop-in barrel from Enfield, sort it out, cut off the stock. Um, you'd have already had one of these sites anyway, likely from your service rifle B, and you put it on. Uh, simultaneously with these, there were lots and lots of Mazda 98 conversions, lots and lots of P14 and M17 conversions. And uh, as a little aside, 
the only two absolute highest possible scores I've ever seen with a converted military action uh, were shot at 300 yards by someone I was at school with with a converted M17 and another one was shot, I witnessed it in Canada at 600 meters, if I remember rightly, with a number four in a single piece stock. The most elaborate conversions of these, they, they cut the butt socket off and put them in a single piece stock. You've got everything in between, basically just rebarreled and cut down like this with or without the top wood up to fitted into a massive proper target single piece stock uh, with what was known as a Whitaker Special. And these were even doing well at the end of the 70s. There was one British team, international team, that I believe shot Whitaker Specials specifically at the end of the 70s. But uh, these days, they're cheapest chips in the UK, they're starter guns, uh, they can't keep up with the modern rigid actions, particularly now that the ammunition has got a lot better and uh, you, can, you can really tell the difference between an old military action made during the wartime and, um, a, uh, and a modern rigid action made now. So if you bring the camera in closer now, up the front we've got a target tunnel with uh, foresight elements. The barrel, I love these Enfield barrels, they've got, uh, they've got a lovely pattern on them because they're hammer forged and then uh, left as is. We've got the band refitted there. Front sling swivel. I mean, nothing's really changed on this side at all. And then moving down, we've got the, the nice full pistol grip stock compared to the original military one. And uh, this stock is kind of a compromise for shooting and bayonet fighting. Um, and then this one's had a uh, nice butt pad fitted to it, but not all of them do. I suspect that this sling will be moved back for uh, its users, its owner's, original owner's length of arm so that he could have his, uh, have his hand right up against there. These were shot with a two point sling attached to these two swivels, by the way. Later ones, if they stayed in use, typically uh, you'd have an Anschutz rail inleted into there and you shoot it with a single point sling, like a modern target rifle. So if we come onto this side, aside from the serial number, any original markings have been scrubbed and given where they are there. This might be a Maltby uh, wartime production. We've got a nice Parker Hale Model 5C target rear sight that will have likely been used on a 303 as well. And then it's been proofed for 20 tons service pressure by Birmingham. Now, um, the 7.62 conversions typically have a 19 ton proof for, uh, for those that care. So if we pop the top wood off now, this barrel is Enfield 1969, which means that this rifle could not have been converted earlier than 1969. Interestingly, it has a military proof mark there and a Ministry of Defence ownership mark there, which is uh, slightly strange. So on this side, we've got some uh, commercial Birmingham nitro proof marks, 20 tons, 7.62 millimeter, 2.0, that is inches, or 51 of your metric millimeters, and some other marks that I cannot off the top of my head immediately identify. So there you go, a somewhat banal, but nevertheless interesting early British target rifle conversion of a number four. So thanks for watching. Thanks very much to my anonymous friend for uh, letting me come to his place and film his lovely rifle. Hopefully we'll get him, me, and the piece and some ammunition together on a 300 meter range and uh, give it a going over. There's no reason why it shouldn't shoot as well as it did uh, all those years ago when it was probably in competition use. So thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Please consider supporting us on Patreon and uh, see you again sometime. Bye.